Hello and welcome to Stream Theory. I am I'm the host, uh, Jackson, from the YouTube channel Skip Intro, and on the line, also the other host is Thomas Flight of the YouTube channel Thomas Flight. How you doing, Thomas? I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. There's a lot. Uh, I got my shows going. There's a lot of movies coming out. I'm excited about. So there's something to live for, and that's uh, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> There's something to live for. <laughs> that got like dark at the end there. Oh, yeah. I was like, I was like hearing myself do the intro, and I was like, I'm really nailing this podcaster tone. I think. <laughs> I, t TV isn't the only thing keeping you alive. <laughs> no, it is. It is. But usually, I'm the one who says that, and everyone's right, like, right. Ugh. <laughs> and to hear someone else say it, I don't know. Yeah, makes me makes me think I should. Take a hard look in the mirror, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, so we're uh, here to talk about Succession today. Yes. Which is the, the best show on TV, probably. It's the um, best show on TV. And apparently, as you were just telling me right before we started, people are realizing that because uh, it's it's soaring in viewership. Mm-hmm. So season three premiered on October 17th, uh, and it had 1.4 million viewers across all platforms which was the best premiere night performance for any HBO original series from since HBO Max launched in May 2020. Uh, this is from Deadline. And it seems like most of that viewership was digital. So digital, uh, regular broadcast viewership was only 13% increased, but digital viewing was up 214% from the season two premiere. I looked at the numbers and I think that like the previous high for any episode was like two or 730,000 viewers for the yeah, season one yeah. finale. So this was double that. So I guess people have been doing their homework in the, uh, the two years between season two and season three. I think, uh, and I just dropped a video about succession and there was a bunch of people in the comments saying like, Oh, I just watched this show or I just started watching or like, uh, one person said like this show was just recommended to me. And I'm curious if, Part of what we're seeing is maybe the effect of like HBO Max as a streaming service now that people are going to for other content. And then uh, I noticed watching stuff on HBO Max that Succession's been, they've been pushing Succession over the last couple of weeks, like leading yeah, up to absolutely. the new season. And I'm sure that's exposing like probably a bunch of people now have HBO Max, even just for the like Warner Brothers movies who didn't have it before. And now they're seeing like, hey, what's this show that is suddenly all over the banner uh, and maybe started watching it in the last couple of weeks? Uh, yeah, I was kind of curious to see how much of the – I saw a lot of press for it, but I wasn't sure if that was, like, just for me because, you know, how fine-tuned all the algorithms are or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, or how much of that was them trying to get people to watch it as opposed to uh, gauging an interest that already exists kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then I saw the so the NBA season started last night, and NBA it was NBA on TNT. TNT is also owned by Warner, uh, Time Warner, which also owns HBO, and they did an introduction to the entire NBA season with, uh, they just did the montage like the the opening credits montage, but with all NBA players, um, and like did all the all the you know the music and everything. And yeah, I think that. Uh, that was like really well received. So I feel like it's a bit of both, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which I guess is not a super fun take, but that's where I'm <laughs> going with it. And I mean, it's, it's a common pattern you see with like a lot of good shows kind of build up this momentum over the first couple seasons. That's like, you know, the first two, two, it's not like game of Thrones came out of the gate, uh, being right. sort of the cultural monolith that it was. It took a few seasons. Same with Breaking Bad. Same with, like, a lot of... I mean, it's, it seems I like when like, a prestige show hits, this is the way it does it. But yeah. most shows, usually their best-rated episode is, like, the first episode, is the pilot. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, like, a slow decline and, like, re-staggered decline. But, um... Which was what Succession was doing. Season 2 was just generally right. rated lower than Season 1. Um... Interesting. It was it was just as consistent, but it was like a little bit lower because they lost some people, and now it seems like it's just like shut up because of streaming and maybe people just like to have a backlog of stuff to watch. Yeah, I think that definitely like that definitely plays into it. You know, it's it's fun to binge stuff, and if you can like watch 
there's a certain group of people who like if they can just sit down and watch two seasons of it they might be more likely to get invested at that moment than if they're like oh i have to i can only watch one episode right now um i mean we can we've had discussions about which is better and there's benefits to like a show coming out one one episode a week or whatever but i think there is a certain there's definitely a certain group of people who like are more likely to get into a show if they can just like sit down and binge it um which i don't totally get but you know good for them i'm happy for those people <laughs> the good for good for them I it's all know. the zoomers who are raised on uh netflix instead of but real just like stuff. who do you talk to about it it, it just yeah. feels very isolating um and tv is all about uh community i guess i don't know everybody watches stuff at the same time it's like or th- traditionally it's about community yeah. i guess uh, nowadays, nobody cares. And nowadays, it's, just... it's about watching, binging through Squid Game and then being like, I watched <laughs> I watched it. Um, we should say, I guess we should say, like, in this episode, we're going to discuss basically roughly seasons one and two and the premiere of season three of Succession. So, uh, yes. you know, if we... The... And see and episode two. No, I'm just kidding. No, I <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've I have uh, I've gotten to to watch the next episode. I'm like yeah. Thomas and uh, I just enjoy pr- holding that over people. A privileged <laughs> uh, television critic, uh, unlike the rest of us who web uh, peasants who uh, you know web have peasants to watch, <laughs> have to watch things at 9 p.m. on Sunday. Like everybody, I think else. you have to uh, change your Twitter uh, bio to. Web peasant. <laughs> Internet peasant. <laughs> I like that. Um, so where do you want to start? Uh, this is the thing that I find the hardest thing about Succession is that there are so many things that this show is doing well um, that I'm frankly overwhelmed by all of the things I want to talk about with it. I was thinking about this the other day. It's like there are a lot of I, – I do TV criticism, and there are a lot of TV shows that are f- – fine and there are a lot of tv shows that are maybe not as fine and every once in a while a show comes along that's like truly great and there are so many it makes you like want to talk about so many different things about it that it's like overwhelming to kind of uh touch on anything you can't find like a through line to talk about all the stuff um i'm sure you had the same idea with parasite and why you made like eight videos about it on your channel um but yeah i i have no idea where to start with succession uh, so I'll let you steer. Let's, I think, I think maybe a good way to lay the groundwork since we've never talked about the show on this podcast. Well, I don't know. Maybe we did talk about, I think we did talk about it a little bit at one point, but we haven't talked about it recently on this show. Um, maybe a good way. We both recently rewatched, uh, the show prior to season. Th- I didn't rewatch all of season one, I kind of skipped ahead because I knew I wanted to kind of focus on season two sure. for my video and I was running out of time. Um, so I, <laughs> But I just rewatched season two uh, right before we started season three. So maybe let's just like talk about the show in general sure. uh, and lay that foundation and, re- and rewatching it, maybe what we got out of that, and then go into sort of the premiere of the new Yeah, um, sure the new season. So was there what, – what were your um, impressions – revisiting the show you know did that change the way that you that you looked at it or were there kind of new things that that so you I st- found i remember watching the show i remember seeing the the promos for the show and watching the first episode like the day after it came out um and then watching i i watched it in in real time that first season um and i remember it being like this is a weird show uh like the first couple and i was I remember watching the first two especially and then seeing yeah. a bunch of TV critics on Twitter being like, are people watching this show? How do you feel about it? And I specifically remember being like, yeah, this is kind of like a tough ask. I remember the scene that really did it for me was uh, was Roman masturbating to the, the New York City skyline and being like, I'm not right. sure that this is a show. I'm not sure what this is. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. uh, And then a lot of people hit you know, the fifth, sixth, seventh episodes. And then they were like, oh, wait, no, this is actually brilliant. Yeah. No, and know. and then they, they they kind of said that. And then, like, this narrative was, and whenever you tell people or you try to get people to watch the show, it's like, it takes a couple episodes to get going. 
Um, and when I rewatched it, I just didn't think that was the case at all. I think yeah. that the show has this really distinctive tone um, where all the characters are lying all the time and they are tr- they know everyone else is lying and they're trying to decipher what everybody else means. And that's just something that that's never like spelled out for you as a viewer. So it's something that you kind of have to get used to. And it takes a couple episodes to get used to. But if yeah. you go back and watch it, that's right there from it's, the very it's beginning. There. Yeah. yeah. Um, and when you like you rewatch the pilot, and it's like, oh, all of these characters are pretty fully realized already. We just aren't familiar with them yet, so they feel yeah. not fully realized. Yeah. It doesn't do that TV thing of uh, lots of exposition. It just kind of drops you in the middle, and uh, yeah, like when you first watch it, you're like, oh, Logan is gonna step aside. Oh, he pulls a switcheroo on Kendall. And when you rewatch it, it's pretty clear that Logan is never going to step aside yeah, for yeah. Kendall. You and see from the moment he comes up with the papers, you, yeah. you, I mean, which part of that is just hindsight of like knowing what he's going to do. But like he's, he's being real shady, like out the gate in the show. Um, and everybody is, everybody's playing their hand. Like, you know, it's, it's, uh, except maybe Connor, but that's a different <laughs> 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 is he even in the pilot? I'm trying to remember. He must he be, is, right? He yeah. is. His big moment in the pilot is he like gives the sourdough to uh, uh, Logan oh, yes, a Oh, yes, yes, yes. And he's like, uh, old my bread. Fr- <laughs> he's like, thank you for the, <laughs> the old bread. <laughs> my friends in New York actually had a viewing party for the season three premiere, and they hyper decanted some wine for... <laughs> Which apparently yeah. is a real thing, and apparently just involves putting wine in a blender. A blender, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, here's the shout out to the, all the con heads out there who are, you know, decan- hyper decanting their wine and eating sourdough. Um, no, I definitely had a very similar experience, like revisiting it, and I remember watching it and watching it the first time and being like, "What is this?" The t- it, like you said, it has such a unique tone, and I was like, "Is this a comedy? Is this like..." Uh, drama because it like the closest thing I had to relate it to was like it's kind of like corporate veep but like more serious yeah. and it's an hour long and it, it uh, kind of feels like the big short um yeah which makes sense because Adam yeah. McKay directs the pilot he directed the big short which yeah. is funny but also about like a very serious uh issue about like the collapse of uh yeah the American economy. It's um, part of the 2008 housing crisis cinematic universe. <laughs> Did you make that video? Did, did, there, I, I have not made that video about. yet, okay. but I'm collecting a list of movies about the 2008 housing crisis. That I want to eventually, because <laughs> there's a lot wait. of them. There's like, there's, a, there's actually more movies about it than you would maybe expect examining it from like a bunch of different angles, like homeowners, like uh you know the people at the oh, is top. It the florida project about that kind of the florida project is kind of about the fallout from that and then yeah. there's a movie with uh andrew garfield and michael shannon where they're like um uh the people who go in and tell you you can't be in your house anymore what's that called uh, oh uh like repo people yeah yeah um, I, I, that's not what they're called with no no housing, there's but, a yeah. yeah there's a name for them but anyway so Repossessors. eventually i'm gonna make i'm gonna make a video about the 2008 but the big short is probably like the central film. Yeah, that, yeah. I think it's that. the most famous and yeah. uh, with no background information at all, probably the best at yeah. like summarizing what happened and explaining it, and also being both funny and, and terrifying. <laughs> yeah, terrifying. Which I think is the same tone that this show is going for yes. in broad strokes. Yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, yeah. It 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 really hits the ground running. And throws you into that world and it just expects you to to get to its place which is great i think that's the hallmark of like a show that's doing something unique and is really confident in what it's doing and uh that it's like it's 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 hard to understand what it is at first because it's doing something that really you know it's it's adapting on a lot of themes and even you know in my video that i made about it i was talking about the cinematography and the use of camera and great video by the way a lot of, thank you a lot of people were talking about like oh yeah this is you know similar stuff was done in veep or the office or whatever and that's true but there's also like it's it's not just copying those styles but it's it's developing like this the show in a lot of Mm -hmm. ways feels like a next step 
in certain like you know stylistic trends that have been developing in television uh and for it feels a while. way more handheld than veep or uh the office i think like i think you did a really good job of of highlighting how it feels like very reactionary to what's going on and that that's definitely in like the office and veep as well but it's not as frenetic um so i don't think that they kind of uh, and and i think that another thing you pointed out in your video um which is good is that it in those shows you still kind of feel like you're in the middle of the of the scene like there will be a shot right. of, like there'll be a conversation between selena and her team or something yeah, and the yeah. camera is kind of in the scene i think this is actually like nobody talks about this but i think this is this kind of started in uh in american television at least with like arrested development um which was shooting everything with two cameras um mm -hmm. and and doing a similar kind of thing but they they would have put put cameras right in people's faces and yeah. one of the things that succession does is this always feels like it's on the periphery of the room yeah. uh like looking in or trying to like peer over someone's shoulder people are obstructing the shot and and stuff like that so i thought that was a great observation is like very central to the the tone that's going on here there's a really great hour-long interview with the two cinematographers the two main cinematographers from season one and two um that i watched that informed a lot of what i talk about in that video i'll link i'll link to it in these in the show notes for this but it's it's really fascinating if anyone's interested in learning more about the show's cinematography because uh they they i talk about it in that video but they go really into depth on like in terms of the lengths that they go to to really kind of create that environment and actually like the way they light the show you know the like all lighting those, it must be a nightmare well the, it's 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 fascinating because a lot of those like um office interiors like at waystar royco yeah because those windows are so huge that's like a real floor they rented in the uh i believe the new um world trade center building they just like had like an entire floor that they built the offices out in okay so they could have like had a set for that that was very tightly controlled that you know they where they controlled the lighting and but it's real it's or it's a set that's built on a real location so whatever the weather is outside you know whatever the sunlight Damn. is doing they just have to shoot around that um and so i know that in the it definitely looks like in uh i'm specifically thinking of like one scene but it like when they were on the boat in the beginning of season two shiv and tom are on oh their, yeah that like, was honeymoon that was definitely a green screen and yeah, that's the yeah. thing that you run into all the time where it's like the outside yeah. is like super overexposed but you're trying to like keep the interior yeah at this other this other thing some sometimes you can see that like i don't know i just i lighting stresses me out because it's like, so hard <laughs> and every time i think about it at the show where it's like it feels like they're just like running along i'm like no yeah. uh I they, would be the first person at the like Ayatsi strike. I'd be like, no, <laughs> too hard. <laughs> they uh they do um well, I think that's that's one of the great things about the show. Uh there's some more research that I was doing that didn't didn't make it into that video, but like I was thinking a lot about the set design and the production design and the way that kind of informs the show because it's about these I mean, we haven't really talked, I'm assuming most people listening to this have seen the show because we haven't really talked about like what it's even about or the setting or anything. But like, it's obviously hard it's about all about. these incredibly wealthy, elite, one percenter, you know, media tycoons and the, the spaces they occupy, the offices, the houses, the like, there's not a lot going on in the show. It's like people walking around, standing around and talking. But they're obviously using, like, HBO budget to just be like, yes, we actually got this massive yacht and just shot an episode on, like, a, you know, insanely, you yeah. know, obnoxiously large yacht. One um, of the things a lot of people talk about is, like, this show in comparison to Billions especially um, and, and movies like this, like, Wolf of Wall Street or something like that. Yeah. Where they're about, like, corrupt, wealthy people and um a lot of people point to those things like wolf of wall street or billions and they they kind of call it like wealth porn where right. it's you're looking at all these super rich people and you're really impressed by how much money they have and it's like wow i wish i could be that rich and something that i think succession does really well um and i don't know if they talked about this in the cinematography thing but they're 
they stay so tight on the characters that it doesn't always really it, I mean they are they have a lot of wealth and yeah, that is part yeah. of the thing and we definitely know that but I don't think that the show like lingers on the like opulence too much no. um and when it does it often like balances it with like the staff upkeeping stuff so like in the there's that season uh two episode where they go to the beach house and they're uh or the house in the hamptons and there's like this great shot of like all of the the this like banquet that they have set out yeah and then like a couple scenes later logan's like ah throw it out and then yeah. we like watch the staff like throw it out and just all of the waste yeah. um and on the yacht there's like you watch like the staff like upkeeping everything and uh so i think that it i, I just wanted to point that out i guess that's definitely that's definitely at least from what they were saying uh, a very conscious choice like they don't spend a lot of time you know shooting these wide shots of the location to make it be like ooh, look how I'm, you know they just like drop the characters into the place and we get a sense of like the opulence just because they're in these nice locations the production design is is well done but uh but that's not like glorified necessarily through the the like cinematography sp specifically and then they also like another thing they talk about in that interview is intentionally kind of, kind of trying to not like make the lighting be like overly pristine or you know they like want it to feel like a real space and then to what you're talking about i think the show does an excellent job of at at many points like framing the lives of these people within the context of like here's the people that surround i mean it starts in episode one where they like uh roman is like yeah. pulling that incredibly inappropriate like prank or game with that where he kid. rips up that million dollar check yeah, in front of yeah. the kid's face because he didn't hit a home run exactly um and so that that persists throughout the show and then spoilers for uh, the end of episode one with like uh, the 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 kid that dies in the accident uh, with with Logan or not Logan with Kendall yep and then you know they're also obviously they're dealing with like scandal uh, involving the death of this uh, woman on the cruises and all these things so that that stuff several. is is <laughs> yeah several that stuff is a constant sort of theme throughout the show and the characters can't really escape that um, and so I think that's one of the one of the things that allows this show to not move into that like uh, wealth porn uh, sort of space, um, which I think or at is least great. be more resilient to Beyond, it. Because there least... are always people who will misunderstand. Right. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. I saw a bunch of people posting like on Columbus Day uh, this clip from The Sopranos where Tony is like defending Christopher Columbus and his son is reading like Howard Zinn's <laughs> People's History of the United States right. and being like, hey, wait, Columbus was bad. And he's like, Columbus was a great American. And they're like, wow, people trying to cancel Columbus. Be more like Tony Soprano. Tony Soprano. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, and, and even just like I, uh, uh, against my better judgment, after the season three premiere, I just like dipped into uh, one of the Reddit discussion threads about the, about the episode. And there was a bunch of like the general sentiment in there was like, this is now we're getting this is kind of spoilery territory for season three. Sure. But there was a bunch of people who were like, oh, um, Kendall was being a real dick to all the women in that episode and 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 he was but they were treating that as if like this shows kendall's true colors and i was like i don't think it was ever in question that like kendall is a terrible person you yeah. maybe <laughs> you you sympathize him you sympathize with him maybe a bit more because he's going he's in direct opposition to arguably the worst person on the show logan yeah. but that doesn't make him good. Like he's he's I, been a terrible person from like yeah. There's scenes where he straight up just like threatens people. Like it, it, you know he there's there's a lot of yeah. yeah. Kendall sucks. Uh, I don't know. All like, of them suck. I don't think yeah. that, I don't think anybody. Who's the, the least tier? Give me your tier list. Okay. Like so terrible to least terrible. <laughs> so this is the thing: is all of the characters are both. They are both they. Most of them, like any great TV show, 
or probably movies. I don't know. I've heard that they do this in movies too. But every character has like a defining flaw or defining characteristic that is both their greatest strength and their greatest weakness. Um, and like, like Shiv is a great example. Shiv is like this um, amazing liar. She's like the second best liar on the show. She's other than Logan. Like she's able to just like totally manipulate people. She's a brilliant tactician, but she's also like, has no moral compass and has no loyalties to anyone. And she's just a snake. Uh, and for Kendall, Kendall is like, I mean, the, the thing that uh, Logan says to him at the end of season two is you're not a killer. Right. right. And that's kind of his defining thing is that he's, he's like the worst at like lying and like the double talk that they all do, which I think makes him like kind of the most, sympathetic because we're like oh look he's not as like essentially dishonest he's not as, as good everyone else. evil as the other people that's right yeah <laughs> but it, also he's still evil so it's yeah, like yeah. uh yeah i don't know um there's something refreshing about how upfront roman is about being the worst that right. i think is is admirable i think a lot of people would say greg is the is the least bad but i i think he, i think people underestimate how people much underestimate. Like, weaseling greg has been doing uh, both on the show and off the show. <laughs> I want to, I want to, this is a slight tangent, but I want to go on record on the internet and say that I think it's possible. I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not saying this is my, my prediction, but I just want to say that I think it's possible this show ends with Greg as the CEO of Waystar Royco. <laughs> I had this distinct feeling re when I rewatched the pilot and saw like how present and much a yeah. part of the show Greg was and like how right away he was just like, like yes. Logan, he, he is doing things really awkwardly. It's he's kind of like Kendall in that, like he's bad at being evil, but he's also, he's like completely willing to just go in there, leverage what little he does have and say like, this is what I want. And you can see in the pilot that like Logan respects that. And he's like, he's like, okay, you know, and then there's a moment where he's like, he the, he's talking to somebody i think it's in the pilot about uh greg and they're like you know what, what he they're like what is he good for and and logan's kind of like oh i don't know you know maybe you know who knows maybe like head of parks or something you know he's like throwing out these really like insanely yeah. like absurdly high level positions you know and greg's someone who just like walked up to him and was like hey i'm your nephew you know I puked through Dodrick's. I got sick of Dodrick's eye holes. <laughs> so I'm just My saying. Underrated Greg scene is when he's calling his mom and telling him that, telling her that someone else smoked a smoked a doobie <laughs> in his car. Um, yeah, I, you and I have talked about this off air, but I think that one of the things that really stood out to me on the rewatch was how much how much Greg is like consciously doing the entire yep, time. Yeah. Cause the first time you watch it, first of all, he feels like you're, he feels like the audience avatar at first. Yeah. Um, Kendall might be like the main character. If you can say that the show has one, but Greg is like the outsider and he's like coming in. So we get to like view their, like things get explained to him the way yeah. th they get explained to us. So that puts you in like a sympathetic position with him. But like you said, he's just asking for a job right off the top. Um, then in in that first so in that first episode, he's already weaseled his way into the inner circle. All of a sudden, he's playing in the baseball game, and Tom immediately recognizes that he's a threat. Uh, the second episode, he's playing Shiv and Roman off of each other, trying to get the papers for Marsha and deciding whose side he wants to take, um, and getting mugged by Shiv. Uh, and then there's. He obviously uh, maintains the papers uh, when he's put in charge of yeah, yeah. disposing of them. And he also realizes that Tom is going to try and go public with everything and tells Jerry. And this episode plays it like you're supposed to think that Shiv did it. Um, and Tom thinks that. And there's like the reveal at the end. But for whatever reason, I just like totally had forgotten that. But like that was him. And he also sees Sandy and Stewie talking at the end of the first episode. Um, and he recognizes Stewie as the person who was talking to Kendall. And it's clear yeah. that like, he just, he just is like around and he's just like collecting information. My favorite thing is that at the end of season two, 
Tom calls him a benign fungus, and it's so accurate. Like he's just <laughs> right, right. He's just there all the time, and yeah. he's just like soaking up information. And he tells Kendall, like Kendall's whole press conference doesn't happen without Greg. Greg is the one who gives him the papers, and yeah. when exactly he approached him on that or whatever, I'm not. Totally, sh- like I'm not sure how active he was. Well, if he was like, "Hey, look, I can give you the papers," or if Kendall just remembered that he had them because he had told him at the end of season one. Yeah, but Greg is Greg's out there. He's scheming. You know, he's he's awkward and nice about it, and like asking Tom if he can blackmail him. But he he is blackmailing people. Like yeah, he yeah. is doing the thing. He, I think Greg, Greg represents something important in the show. Uh, and this is something that I was thinking about more rewatching it was just like the overarching themes and like what it's saying. It's obviously it's about wealthy people, media and capitalism, but like what, what I was thinking about, like, what is the show trying to say about those things? Um, and I think one of the things that was becoming more clear to me rewatching it was, uh, it does a really incredible job of educating how like or not educating i mean it is kind of educating people in a sense but uh illustrating how like these people are all playing a game they're wrestling for power and money and prestige amongst each other but really the game they're playing is not at all about uh competency which is often what like capitalism purports itself to be is it's like oh it's a great system because the most competent people, the people who are the best at stuff rise to the top, and that's good for everybody. But, like... The show is kind of that meme where it's, like, capitalism promotes innovation, and it's all, like, a red car that looks... Like right, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, like, instead of competency, you have all these people who are actually pretty, like, terrible at doing what they're doing. Like, nobody is really good or experienced at running a media company, uh... They're just good at perpetuating their own power and their own, uh, like, uh, you know, just like. It, so it's all. So Greg comes in. All of their and, all of their feats, business feats, are usually um, like avoid are usually cleaning up messes that they made like yes. already pre-existing like scandals or something it's like you see this on the Forbes like 40 under 40 or whatever and it's always like CEOs uh like the best ceos in the country and they're always like people who cleaned up like horrific (laughs) it's like uber handled being canceled really well so the ceo gets like a gold star it's like i think the emphasis might be in the wrong place there but yeah uh, you were saying but they're they're all kind of incompetent in their own unique ways um like that's the hilarious part i think about the show is like like the kind of the conceit of the show is like one of these family members is going to get the seat and who is it? And, uh, presumably. And yeah, and they're all, but the, the, the joke is that they're all actually like really not well suited for the job. Like the person who is, who makes the most sense is Kendall. Who's, who's next in line at the beginning of the show. And he does terrible deals. Like he buys Valter, like, we're introduced to him as he's doing a terrible job of buying Valter, which then ends up just being a garbage, yep. tr- you know, garbage heap of a company that like doesn't, you know, is that like he then guts. financially yeah. insolvent that he then guts and like they, you know, they destroy. So it's like he's not even good at his job within the context of like, you know, how the job is supposed to right. be done in those people's own mind right the reason that he is the most sympathetic because he's bad at lying and playing games is also what makes him bad at lying and playing games and doing the corporate thing yes yeah 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 um now i think in season three we're moving into an interesting territory where like he's playing a new game which is this this corporate that he might be actually better at but it's still a game which is like the corporate uh uh what's the word um like basically just like we're gonna subsume like a a like takeover corporate takeover um uh, god i don't know my corporate jargon <laughs> what's the word no it's not a corporate jargon it'd be like cultural uh like a marcusa thing like cultural um sublimation sort of it'll it'll come to me but like he's trying to use he's trying to use essentially what should be like this moment of 
like, hey, we are dealing with these, uh, the scandal and these people who were harmed and trying to fix, he's leveraging that for his own personal gain. Like he doesn't actually yes. care about the women who were harmed in the Cruz's scandal. He, he doesn't, doesn't even care about the women in his life. He doesn't even care about the women in his life. He's purely like, oh, I see this as an angle where I can like leverage basically the culture war, quote unquote, yep. corp to my like advantage in this like corporate takeover. Um, and so I think that's a new that's a new angle in the show, and he might prove to be like better at doing that than maybe he is. Like it'd be hard playing, to be worse, right? <laughs> playing the game, but he's clearly not playing the like good at like playing the game. Logan, the way Logan played it. That's right. Yeah. Um, um, which is why Logan never respected him. I right. I, I have like a slightly different um, take. You were saying that the show is kind of about who is going to take over. We know one of these people is going to take over. And I think that the show, uh, I mean, maybe that was like the opening. That's definitely like the opening. I mean, thing, well, right? I should say, I mean, I'll let you say what you're going to say, but I should say, I don't think that's what the show's about necessarily. I just think that's like sort of the dramatic conceit right. that like keep gets us interested at the beginning and sort of is keeping our attention. Right. And I think that that's true for the first season and, and maybe like part of the second season. But I think that once the... I think that this is always lingering in the back, and I'm writing an essay about this sure, too, so yeah. I don't want to step on myself too much, uh, scoop myself, but I do think that it has kind of shifted into this existential dread of how you know that it's going to fail. Like, the company is not going right. to survive. Yeah, the family yeah. is not going to survive. This is an empire in decline and um, about to totally implode and collapse in part because of their own incompetency and in part because they've they've just eaten themselves like they've just they've done right. so much shit to 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 get to where they are and those things are coming back to to haunt them in in so many ways but um yeah i think that it, i think that at some point it shifted into this like more uh this more like dread thing where succession isn't about who's going to take over the company but it's about what's going to come after waystar right right that's uh that that's that's an interesting uh angle and i can definitely see that i can definitely see that i think a lot of that will come from where it's it's interesting in that like a lot of that has to do with sort of the trajectory the, the what's interesting about the show is its relationship to the world we act with the real world that we yes. live in and how it's illustrating like power dynamics and corruption in a family uh a wealthy elite family um and and sort of the like the appeal of all of that is we're all watching this imagining like that's what's going on at you know i don't know warner brothers or like, i mean it, we whatever should, these... we should say that the uh the the roy family has been talked about as being a a pretty direct stand-in for the murdoch family who owns fox right. news yes um I think Jesse Armstrong, the creator of Succession, has said, you know, they're not a directly the, you know, they're more of a broad thing. It's not a commentary on the Murdoch specifically. But yeah, that yeah. that is like, uh, just, I didn't want to, I didn't want that to go unsaid. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. not unsaid when you say it, you know. Right, right. Um, <laughs> so, like, I think there's this question of, like, that there's a critique that it's sort of presenting, which you can almost barely call a critique or a commentary. It's more just like, we're going to illustrate this reality, like what we see as probably like, that's the interesting thing to me is like the show is kind of satire, but in a way it doesn't even really feel like satire. It just feels like let's put on screen, you know, a, a rough approximation of what we might imagine, you know, people in this situation are going through. Now right. all the characters are like way more funny, witty, clever, you know, than like yeah. uh, their real life proxies would be. But like the situations, like the fact that they're, you know, wrestling over, you know, they're buying this company and they're embroiled in skin, like all that stuff is like, that's real stuff. It's just, you know, fictionalized versions of it. Um, I mean, look at what like Facebook's going through right now and exactly. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. All, so um, in a way, like the context of the show is is one that is very realistic in terms of the context of our own world. And that's, that's part of what's very interesting about it. Um, 
And I think that, yeah, I, I just to piggyback off of that, I was reading an essay by Matt Zollerseitz and Alan Seppenwall about Seinfeld. Um, and they were talking about, uh, I swear this is about succession. Uh, and they no were talking, Seinfeld, I will not allow any Seinfeld talk unless I don't know. Have you heard of this show? In. It's called Seinfeld. It just joined Netflix. Um, no, it's kind of, um, is that, is that like have to do with the comedian Jerry it's, Seinfeld? It's is a it show like a about spin off nothing. of coffees and cars with. The- <laughs> <laughs> so it's a show about nothing. Um, But they said that they were writing that there's this old playwright adage um, that drama is about how it's about people changing. Um, It's like a narrative arc. People change. And and comedy is about finding humor in the fact that people don't change, Um, which is Seinfeld in a nutshell. Right. Like these characters never learn anything. They're just awful all the time. And somehow I think Succession is doing both at the same time. I was reading an S- I was reading an interview with Jesse Armstrong, and he was like, "I don't really think that people can change." Um, so that would lead to the comedy part. But also, we are seeing like these arcs of characters where they are growing. Might not be the right word. <laughs> they're, they're kind of like, but they are changing. Like right. um, I think this is most like most embodied by Roman who is like yes. totally yeah. incompetent at the beginning of the series. Like he gets the CEO, the COO job and has no idea what he's doing. And he sees a bunch of emails come in in the second episode and gets completely overwhelmed and jerks off at the city instead. And uh, I mean, we've all been there, right? But <laughs> <laughs> by the end of this, by, by where we are now, he's like very competent and yeah. he is, He does, like, the whole – he is, like, courting the Azerbaijani money at the end of season two and then also telling Logan, actually, I think this is a bad deal. We shouldn't do it. Right, yeah. And he's he's positioning himself with Jerry, and he's, like, getting much closer to the top. But also, like, all of that stuff is coming at him being somehow even worse as a person. Like, he's advocating – I think he says, like, in the first episode – I know this isn't great to say, but, you know, maybe we chop your son up, chop Kendall up and throw him in the Hudson. Yeah, it's yeah. like, whoa, whoa what? <laughs> so I don't know if that's like character growth, but it's certainly character development metastasism. <laughs> <I don't... laughs> they're they're all they're all grow. They're all on the arcs to becoming even more terrible. Yeah, they're they're uh, growing like tumors. Uh... <laughs> well, and and Shiv's arc is also one of just becoming an increasingly terrible person. She le- like not that politics is necessarily, you know, ha- there's issues there too, but she's I mean, like, she was working for Bernie and she now was she's campaigning for essentially Bernie Sanders proxy and then and then uh she bailed on that to go get, you know, go f- scrabble, s- you know, fight with the rest of the family for the for power and money and, you know, whatever, whatever else. On Which the I rewatch, think, it's so obvious that he is just he dangles that in front of her just, just for, to get rid of her from the campaign, uh, the he, the Bernie Sanders campaign. Who? Wait, say that Logan, again. I think I think on the rewatch, it's pretty clear to me that Logan is like, you are going to be CEO. Oh, as a way of getting yeah. her out of that campaign. Right, and right. once she burns that bridge, he's like, oh, yeah, who the fuck cares? So I don't care. Let's talk about this because I think this this would be a really interesting discussion. I think the most interesting and enigmatic character uh, and may, I mean, a lot of people talk about Jeremy Strong, but I think maybe even the, the, the best performed character on the show is Logan Roy. I thought you were going this, with Tom. I really thought that oh, was... Oh, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Tom is also... I mean, also A great. man with like, multitudes. It's hard, it's hard to rank performances because everybody on the show is just firing on, like, all cylinders. There's it's not especially bad... crazy when you, like, hear Matthew McFadden and Sarah Snook's, like, real voices, and you're like, oh, they're doing accents as yeah, well. Yeah. No, <laughs> there is... Everybody is just killing it in the, in the performance department. There's not a, a weak link in them. Um, but I think for me, like, Logan Roy is one of the most fascinating because... He's such a strong, complete character. There, you can't like look at him and be like he's inconsistent. There's like such a lo- perverse logic to the way he behaves and the things he does, and uh, it all feels so motivated. But he's like he's some type of like chaos incarnate, and there's like a really it's really difficult. Like I can't tell. Like I feel like most people, I kind of I know where they're coming from. Yeah. Like, 
Like, you know that Shiv really wants this. It's like their, their feelings are not concealed from the audience. Logan, and, and this is part of what makes the show work, because I think if you, if you really knew it would remove some of the, the drama, but like a lot of times, like when Logan is standing there telling Shiv, he's like, this is real. Like, remember the slant of the light or whatever. It's like yeah. in that moment, I don't know if he's lying to her. I don't know if he's like, if he believes in that moment, like I'm, I'm telling, you know, I've decided this is it. And then he just like, you know, changes his mind later. Or if the entire thing is a play, I feel like I never get a, a, um, like a, a handle yeah. on that. Um, yeah. I think and Rhea Jarrell sells it up, uh, sums it up really well in at the end of season two, where she's like, it's kind of like a superpower you have being able to just lie to people's faces. Yes. And he's like, she's like, I know you're lying, yeah. but it yeah. feels genuine and I want to believe you. And, I think that the I think that the real thing that he the thing that makes him like hard to uh be, uh to nail down is I think that if we we want if we just looked at him as like a capitalist pure greed incarnate thing I think we would be pretty it would be pretty easy to tell what he's about to do right but because the show is framed through the eyes of the children and they know that he wants to do that, but they also can never stop fully trying to earn his favor. And whenever yes. he dangles it, which he totally dangles it just as a way of making them like the most loyal uh, soldiers ever. Yeah. But the, this, the characters can't help but be like, wait, is this finally it? Is this, have I finally earned dad's yeah. approval? Like there's that, uh, I don't know if you've seen that someone did a, the, they did the lyrics for the song that were rejected and it's, it's a, he's like a comedian and it was just, I'm who will earn daddy's kiss, who will earn right, daddy's right, kiss. Right. Yeah. Um, and that is, I mean, that is the, the essence of the show, but in, in some ways I think, and I think it's just that, that tension between he's a great liar. We don't know exactly what his play is. I think it's pretty safe to assume at all points that he's going to fuck over whoever, and it doesn't matter who it is. Um, but we still can't, because the show is framed through the eyes of these kids, we can't, like, you, you see Shiv know that it might not be real in right, that moment yeah. that you're talking she, about. But you yeah. also see in her eyes how much she desperately wants it to be real. Uh, yeah. And and she can't resist that kind of uh, allure. Yeah. Yeah, no, okay, so there's two two angles here, and I want to I wanna get at both of them. Okay. Okay. Um, and one is, one is going deeper into Logan, but we'll come back to that. Uh, sure. First, I want to talk about how what you just said, I think, is a theme throughout the show and is part of its broader commentary about sort of like about capitalism and why uh, it causes problems. Um, <laughs> and it, you see because you see the same thing that Logan is doing, which is like, I'm going to dangle this position to all my children and then and then force them to like play games with each other and basically use that as a manipulative tactic to just get them to do my bidding do whatever i want um this you see his kids do that to other people um yep. and like and it's embodied sort of in this in the first uh in the first episode we all, we already talked about Roman writing that check for a million dollars for the child of one of the one of their their servants caterers or something yeah, yeah, caterers or something you know it's like a family that's standing there just kind of watching they were helping with the catering and he's like kid come over here writes him a million dollar check is like if you can hit a home run here's a million dollars and uh it's the same maneuver of like I'm gonna dangle the possibility of a really big reward and then get you to play games in order to uh to try to entertain me essentially get that entertain me and also and like and also to get because you have the hope of getting that reward and that same thing also explains why greg turns down uh turns down the money from his uncle and instead goes with the possibility of logan because he's playing this game for this like possible greater reward that lies out there 
Um, and in that, I think, is also the central theme of, um, of another show that talks about capitalism that's been a really big hit recently, which I won't spoil, but we, I think, have you finished Squid Game? I sure have. Um, which we both watched. But Squid Game has a, has a central image, which is like all these people playing a game, and there's this huge like pot of money just like dangling over them. It's not um, very subtle, no. It's not very subtle, no, no, no. It's it, <laughs> success. I don't know if Succession is like a less subtle show, <laughs> it, but it's, it's it's hard to say because it is very much about corporate America. Yeah. Uh, but I think but, I yeah. think that's like I mean that's not a not I guess that's not like that novel or profound of an insight to be like success or capitalism manipulates people by like dangling a big reward over their head the possibility of like wealth but it's like well and then all pulling it away at the last second and right? then pulling it away but what all these people are what all these what keeps people in the game is this like possibility of reward that's being dangled over their heads um and that is what perpetuates this game and then within that game they're like the reward is so great that like you know whatever whatever we're playing or you know whatever any moves are valid sure within this game because you know we'll screw people over we'll you know kill people dump them in the river whatever it takes to get this reward and that's what we see companies companies and people in companies actually doing uh, a lot right because it's the the market structure right like you it's not it's not because i mean there are definitely evil like bosses but like the point is to reduce the cost of labor as much as possible that's like the way that you make a profit like that's the that is the fundamental rule of the system so like you have to like dangle and exploit because that's how it works um i did want to push back on that idea just a little bit though because um for these characters sometimes the money is like not even really that important um like for like for roman there's a scene, the Thanksgiving ep- Ugh, ate my words there. The Thanksgiving episode of the first season, there's the the biggest turkey is uh is a movie that Roman helped like get made, I guess, and he hates it. Even though it's like apparently like not that bad and also is like the biggest Thanksgiving box office hit ever and it's making everybody tons of money, but Roman's like pissed about it because to one thing that I think the show does really well is it shows that like the power and prestige and money is like this zero sum game and it's always being compared to the people around you. So, uh, even, even though like Greg is getting money and he like turns down, uh, this other, he turns down this other money because it's not, there's no like prestige with it. And he is definitely like a victim of this, like more thing. Like at the end of the second season, he's like, yeah, this is champagne, but it's not my favorite champagne. And right, right. uh it everything is is in comparison to everyone around them and like Tom is always like looking at uh I mean this is more Tom kind of sometimes is like embodying the white lotus guy who's like this isn't like the greatest sweet, is it? Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> this isn't the pineapple sweet. Um and I think that you kind of see that going on a lot is that this these characters are are more concerned with the game and winning the game than uh getting any money at all right 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 yeah and i i i do agree with that i think uh my point was more that the system dangles of dangling a reward to incentivize the this like conflict and vying for position is uh is the through line through all of it yeah uh rather than like and and whatever that reward can be prestige power you know all of these things money can be one of those things and is for is for a lot of people who don't have as much money as they need to just like live a functional life uh for or for most people like money is 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 the the reward that that maintains that position and then you see the kind of the further up you get the less and less money matters and the more these other things like power money is just a means to the power that they want and that's more the like thing that's being dangled um but that gets me into you talking about power in those games gets me into the other thing i wanted to talk about which is 
more on Logan, which is like what he wants. And there's this moment, there's this moment in in the premiere of, of uh, season three where he's live choosing the 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 new CEO. He's decided I'm going to step back and he's like, it's going to be Jerry, Roman or Shiv. And they're all sort of like vying for his attention. And then Roman calls him and is like, hey, I think it should be me. I'm ready. I can do it. And there's this like moment where like Logan's like, okay, yes. And he's like, he's about to say something. And then Roman drops a butt. And then there's a lot more. And he says like, oh, you know, maybe I'm not ready, basically, kind of like, and then he like is like, I think Jerry would be a good option. And as soon as he gets off the phone, Logan is like, Logan is like, Roman's out. Right. And so it's like, whatever he said in that phone call, disqualified. So the one of the things I'm constantly trying to figure out watching the show is like, what exactly is it that Logan wants? Like, what is the thing that's making him tick? Because I think that's like an interesting element of the show is that um yeah when you have these huge powerful people running these companies you know uh, there's there's financial incentives there's different things there's corruption they all have but like part of it is just the fascination of like people wielding insane amounts of power and their whims and how that manifests itself um and so there's this weird dynamic of like not understanding exactly what game he's playing uh right and like changing the rules or like whatever and you see that you see that like with uh kendall where he's like at the end of season two there's that brilliant moment where like he's almost he's you can see he's almost proud of kendall in the moment where kendall like stabs him in the back because i think the constant tension with kendall is like logan wants him to like like be a killer and like you know stand up be a killer and and yet what he presents is is he's ask he also but he also will like abuse you if you don't uh do exactly what he says um uh, yeah which is part I think of his that... manip but okay so i'll wrap up okay i'll wrap up the the uh, phone call thing so my theory is that i think i think he would have given it to Roman or at least like it wouldn't have did that phone call would not have disqualified Roman right up until the point where he said, but, and yep. I think that, but is immediately where he was like, Oh, that's what disqualified, you know, it has nothing to do I with agree. like what he said after that. It's the fact that he like called, asked for it and then added a, but, and that, but is what disqualified Roman. I have two thoughts about that scene. Uh, the, the first is that I'm not totally convinced that Roman didn't know exactly what he was doing when he said the butt and that he was disqualifying himself because like, I don't know. Do you really want to be the face of this, of Waystar during right. this scandal? Like, yeah. I feel like whoever is the face is going to get killed, but uh, not like literally. Yeah. 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 But, uh, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a shiv, shiv throw, you know, orchestrating. Uh, I like the what? game of Thrones. Like, Oh, Tywin doesn't want to be the King. He wants to be the guy behind the King pulling right. the strings. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so there, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, I think what Logan is really after is, uh, a control. And, uh, and, and the only way to really create control after he leaves is to basically have created a clone of himself um in one of his kids right. and the only way to create that in his mind is to uh create someone who can kill him basically right right uh which is why i think he's proud of of kendall in that moment although he's not going to go down without a fight like he you have to like the only person who is worthy of of succeeding logan is the person who can like slay him i think yeah um and and he's gonna go down to the end and i think that if he feels like he has lost and but he has been killed by one of his kids then like his legacy is safe yeah um although he never really talks about legacy uh which i think is an interesting thing um, uh, he seems to be terrified of like dying also like he's preparing he's preparing for this like moment of like 
somebody's going to have to succeed, succeed me. But especially in like the first season or whatever, it's like any mention that like there's this like don't there's a black box of like don't talk about the fact that dad is getting old. Right. Uh, and and, and there's that, that scene in the in Austerlitz where Kendall is like, you're so jealous of your kid. He's like, I, I know I'm lucky. You are so jealous of your kids because we have everything. And I think the implication there is that like having everything has quote unquote made them soft. Right. Um, and R Logan wants them to be the, the ruthless person that he is. Yeah. And yeah. the only way to do that is to, in his mind, I think to create hardship for them by just like, beating the shit out of them emotionally, verbally, and in Roman's case, physically. Um, and hopefully, like, out of that, someone is able to, that, like, hardens them, and then they're able to, like, take them down, and therefore it's, uh, it, you know, he loses, but in in loss there is victory kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. This is where the show, I think one of the things that makes the show truly great is that like everything you're saying is true but then he's a very complex human character in that like he's a little bit proud of kendall but then when he's when he hits the ground fighting back in season three it's not like a oh i'm proud of kendall but i'm just gonna like put up a good fight to like you know sharpen his teeth or whatever it's like he's He's like this. Oh, he's is coming war. to kill him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna like. He's gonna, I'm gonna grind kill his bones one of us. To make is, his bread. One of us is gonna have to die, and and that's like that's legitimately. It seems like how the character feels, and that's a very like, it's it, that's a very. It's sort of it makes him a complex human. He's not just this like machine, who's like not swayed by emotion or anger. You know, just like oh, pure he's calculation. very emotional. Yeah. And none of the characters are like that. And I think that's the that's the amazing thing is that, like, all these characters are extremely human where it's, like, they're doing these plays. But even, like, the dynamic between uh, Shiv and Tom and, like, Greg and Tom and uh, Kendall and the, the other siblings, it's, like, there's this humanity to all of it in the midst of just all the, like, absurd nastiness and, like, fighting and calculation uh, that is part of what like invests us in these characters and uh, makes them like really vibrant uh, on screen. Um, I think a lot of that comes, I mean, the writing is good, but I think a lot of that also just comes through in how they're performed. Um, yeah, I think the but, show's real uh, success is its ability to balance uh, our empathy for these characters without like condoning them. Like, they are still like part of a giant problem and they are like of, I think the show is pretty uh, explicitly like not super high on corporate capitalism um, and certainly not very like sympathetic to it. Um, and, and these characters in particular, like they are bad people uh, in so much as anyone is a bad person. Right. Um, but it also isn't just like, preachy because yeah, it yeah. is it these characters do all have like a they they have multitudes to them like they are yeah. they are all conflicted characters and i think that like um and and i'll be saying this in my my essay but like i think that the reason that the show is so resonant is because we see ourselves in the characters in so many different ways um and i think that it reflects the conflicted feelings we have about ourselves back at us, it, both on an individual level, on a economic level with like capitalism on a, just a, like a national level as like Americans. And uh, I think that that's where the show like really thrives is because it wouldn't work if it was just a mirror of like satire where it's like, I mean, it would work, but it wouldn't be as like as good if it was just like, capitalism's bad you're bad right. because yeah, yeah. capitalism but it's like look like none of us asked to be born into the system into the society into whatever and none of these characters wanted asked to be born to logan roy yeah. they are and that has really messed them up and that isn't that doesn't make them like automatically good people yeah yeah 
but it also doesn't make them automatic. It's like more complicated than that. Yeah, and yeah. I think that the show is really just like trying to wrestle with that while also showing like the decline and fall and inevitable collapse of this empire and being like, I wonder what's yeah. going to happen next. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I think it really thrives on that like dread of, yeah. of the, the, the shoe is going to drop. I think like the, and this is like, I think that the, the first episode of season three is like, especially like this, there's like multiple uh, comments, both ed, uh, consciously and subconsciously, the characters make about uh, Kendall's, like the 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 looming thing over Kendall is that he like killed someone in season right. one, right? Yeah. And Greg is like, oh, this is like OJ, except if he didn't kill anybody. And then Kendall's in a car and is like, the juice is loose, baby. Who said I didn't kill anybody? <laughs> And then uh, Shiv has this great moment where she's talking to Lisa Arthur, the the uh, Kendall's attorney, attorney and she's yeah. like, "Don't hitch your wagon. D- be careful yeah. who's who you hitch your wagon to. Some of these wagons are going in the ditch," yeah. which is just like a beautiful like. Obviously, she doesn't know, but uh, reference to this like obvious thing that is gonna yeah. come up at some point. Like this is Chekhov's gun, right? Um, or yeah, Chekhov's car crash, <laughs> <laughs> and and we're already seeing the pattern for it, which is like this stuff that Logan was involved with covering up in the past is coming up to bite him. So it would make a certain amount of dramatic. There would be dramatic symmetry that would be very satisfying to have like all that stuff come come to fruition and and Kendall needing to uh, to face that. So let's let's get into like. I guess to kind of wrap up the discussion, let's get into maybe like a little bit of that speculative territory. Like, let's do it. Uh, where you think things are going, either this season or with the show overall. Sure. Uh, and so I do like, have I do have the added as we said I've I've seen one more episode. One more episode I gone, than me. I haven't yeah. gone much further. Um, and the second episode is takes place like immediately after this one. A lot yeah. of the episodes will have like time jumps in between them of like some amount of time. This one does not. It's immediately after uh, season or the the first episode ends with Shiv in the car, uh, and you're like, "What's she gonna do?" Yeah. And episode two starts with Shiv in the car. So, yeah. um, I have only seen like literally like two hours into the the future of the, the future. show. So let's go <laughs> past that to uh... sure. I think that what we're gonna see is some mutually assured destruction here. I, I don't really see how Waystar is going to like survive this. Um, they're just dealing with too many things. I've, what is, what does Carl call it on the, on the plane? He calls it like Baskin Robbins, 32 flavors of fucked right here. Right. And they are just, <laughs> they're just, they're just screwed. Like Logan's dealing with this scandal and the impending FBI DOJ investigation which I cannot see possibly working out for Kendall either uh, because he kind of like flies past it in the, in the press conference where he's like, you know, and our complicity will be for another day. We'll, yeah, yeah. we'll deal with that later, but like, you're going to have to deal with that <laughs> and that's not going to be great. And I don't really see how the company is going to survive this in also the, the Stewie Sandy takeover. Um, and, also, there's like three billion dollars worth of debt looming over the yeah. the company that's uh, against its stock price. Plus, Logan is gonna like die at some point. Um, I mean, I don't know. If, I don't think that it's like imminent, but I mean, in the next ten years of the show, there's no way he's yeah. gonna like live that. Well, maybe I don't know. It's some Donald Trump vibes there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I can't see it ending well for anyone. I think it's going to be kind of this, like, tragic – well, depending on your perspective, tragic well, tragic that's, collapse. That, yeah, that's 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 kind of what I was going to get to, which is, like, I think I kind of see it going in a different direction because, to me, what you're describing almost sounds way too hopeful for this show. <laughs> like, like – you know, if I'm getting inside the head of the creators and like what they're what Trying they're doing, what the, what they're uh, communicating with this show, you know, and it's it's hard to know. I haven't I haven't listened to anything with uh, with the creators, so I don't 
I don't really have much of a basis. But if it were me, I'm like, I'm like, if it's about pre like sort of painting this image of like the real a portion of the reality we live in and maybe just sort of like how messed up and corrupt that is um it would almost feel disingenuous to me if all that stuff happened because what's the last corporation that was enveloped in like massive scandal that you know of that disintegrated that like didn't just keep enron trucking (laughs) i guess yeah enron but Oh, that was funny fun fact i did some reading about this but one of the uh head one of the top writers of the show made a, a play about enron um oh interesting before and that was how uh part of how she got on the show so yes yeah. i mean so neither I mean, here nor I, there but i would kind of love i mean i think it would be satisfying and i'm i'm ready for whatever journey this the this, this show is is going to take us on i don't think there's like a right answer to where it should go but but uh yeah i had a dream I, last night that logan about succession um and logan like turned it turned into some like body horror and logan like (laughs) morphed into like a a horror creature with like scythes for hands and i was like i remember thinking because i'm watching the show in my dream and that happens and i remember being like i trust the show but maybe i shouldn't (laughs) but uh i don't think that that's actually gonna happen i think that these guys i mean i don't know how long they're gonna they haven't confirmed yeah, like a season question. four or we anything. Do, yeah, but. we don't know how long how long the show is going to go, but yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree that I think like Kendall's screwed, um, and, I will say- and Logan is going to go down. But I don't, I don't, I don't know if I see waste waste our Royco dying. I mean, Here's maybe the- it does end with yeah. it getting like bought out or something, or or. Well, um, I think I'm seeing a more, a more a, a bigger collapse. Um, in general like sure not just waystar not just right. the roy family but like the world <laughs> i mean kind of i i kind of can't see how they're not going to uh and i i again don't want to like step on myself too much but like i think that there is kind of a a message of like this is destroying the world or destroying the fabric of society like Ewan keeps saying this, and right, right, right. it's it's kind of played for laughs, but I think he's also like with as with everything on the show, like yeah, yeah. there's an element of truth to what he's saying, where he's like, "This is this is destroying the fabric of of society." And I wouldn't be totally surprised if like it ends with like Waystar going down, but also leaving like this incredible scar on society. Yeah. Um, and the show is like taking, uh, looking at these characters for sure. But I think it's also interested in like the, the mark that they're they're leaving. Like these guys are, they they have the ATN host who's literally a Nazi. Like, uh, and and all this. I guess they got rid of him in order to try and get the Pierce money. But right, yeah. um, yeah. I that's how I kind of see it as like this, some kind of. Uh, either symbolic or explicit like maybe this is like the end of us as a yeah. as a anyways yeah <laughs> i could i mean yeah yeah it's, which uh, which would not be very uplifting no no it definitely <laughs> to would, go with but, exactly what you were saying <laughs> but i'll uh i'll one up your i'll one up your doomerism yes. which i think i think is i think the show will go this is destroying society and the problem isn't going anywhere these people are going to continue to perpetuate yeah, their yeah. illness all, all over the place <laughs> but we'll see we'll find out you know obviously my 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 main my main prediction is i think uh i think greg is going to the top we're gonna see greg <laughs> i mean greg. okay the second episode if, is, if is not a big CEO. greg episode and uh you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of i think you're gonna get a lot of a lot of breadcrumbs for either pro or against your your theory there if if spoilers for game of thrones if uh if game of thrones can end with can end with uh, what's his name greg as is king, totally brand yeah as king then greg greg can end up as ceo and i'll tell you this it'll be way more satisfying <laughs> yeah no i'm with you i'm with you uh greg would be a great choice um, maybe Iverson, uh, uh, who is Kendall's son, who gets uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Who knows? <laughs> who I don't think they've even shown since he got hit by 
by Logan. Oh no, he's he's at the park at one point, but yeah. I yeah. love Kendall... I love how they just totally forget Kendall's kids. Because oh, Ken- he forgets. Well, his Kendall kids. forgets Kendall's kids. He comes into the house. He comes into the house in episode three, in the in that first episode, and he's like, "Oh, I did this for you. I did this for you, my ex wife and my children. I can't wait to see them." And then like, Rava's the best. She just doesn't like, even. She just like always sees right through him. Uh, yeah. She's like, yeah, okay, cool, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sure, great, great. Love yeah. that. Love that. Love that you think that. <laughs> no, there was a very brief moment where like. At the start of that episode, where I was like, "Yes, manic Kendall, this is the Kendall energy I've been wanting to see all this oh, it's time." Manic. He's just so mopey in like season two, and you're like, you just want somebody so badly to just stand up against, uh, against Logan, and you're like, you're like waiting, and it feels so good when he's like stabbing him in the back at the end of season two, and then I'm like, "Yes, manic Kendall, I'm here for it," and then so quickly the show's just like, "Nope." Manic Kendall is not somebody you're going to like. <laughs> I love how the first two seasons of the show, um, I, this is especially true in the first season, but it's also true in the second season, of how Logan and Kendall's uh, power is totally zero-sum, like their confidence and power. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Kendall starts at the top with and Logan in the, in the coma, and then as Logan starts to gain his power, Kendall starts to like wane, and then by the end, Kendall's just like m- crying in his arms and he's like, you're my number one boy. Yeah. And then in season two, he's just like looming over him the entire time. And now we're both seeing them with uh, some level of power. I don't know exactly yeah. what's going to happen. I mean, they're definitely going to destroy each other. I don't know that I feel pretty confident about that. I definitely, I, I'm with you there. I think we definitely see both of them go down in flames uh, throughout this process. And then some other f- Greg shaped Phoenix will rise from the ashes. <laughs> it's going to be Greg and Frank at the end. What do you think My- Tom does? What's the trajectory for Tom? Cause he's in a really interesting position. Uh, we finally see him kind of like souring on Shiv at the end of, uh, end of season two and, and even into the beginning of, of this season. I think uh, Tom is very, uh, I don't know. I don't know what Tom does, but I think Tom's finally realizing that the only person who's going to look out after him is him. Yeah. And, uh, there's no, there's no, there's no team. Teams are, yeah. uh, not a thing. In- Except Jerry and, uh, and, and uh, Roman and Roman. That's the yeah. only real team. The, the most, the most dysfunctional team dysfunctional, of all. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't know what Tom's going to do. I think he's going to. Greg will help him out. Once Greg is CEO, he'll he'll remember that Tom helped him back in the day, and he'll he'll help Tom. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> what do you think is gonna happen with Tom? You just think he's gonna? He kind of seems like a benign fungus himself. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know where he'll go unhinged from from Shim, Shiv. Maybe he'll be the one. Tom is one of my favorite characters. Yeah. To like watch. I mean, he's so awful, but he's also one of my favorite characters to watch. And also, I have no real idea of what they're doing with him as like a – like, I don't I, yeah, I yeah. don't know what they're trying to say with him as much he's as I do with the other characters. He's the one who's the least good at playing the game they're all playing. Like, legitimately, I think he's, like, terrible at sort of – like, every – I can't He's think like of the any... Peter Principle, like, embodied, right? He just keeps failing up. Right. Yes. Yeah. Into greater and greater <laughs> levels of failure. <laughs> yeah. But like he himself legitimately, like everybody else I can say, like they are somewhat good, like at manipulating the situation to, to yeah, get what they no want. There's no manipulation going on for Tom. Tom is kind of like being dragged along by like momentum and his relationship to Shiv. But like he, well, except maybe he's starting to, I don't know. So I feel like there's a dividing point. He's either going to like, come into his own and become more ruthless and become like a player in and of himself, or he's just going to like, maybe he'll be the one who gets out or maybe he'll get toasted in the cruises scan, you know, as things, maybe he'll go down in flames with uh, hard to see Greg succeeding without Tom failing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that it's not really, it doesn't seem really possible for Greg to become CEO without being like, and the cruises thing was Tom's fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
just on like a logistical level, but yeah. I'm with you on like a narrative, like poetic justice way. That that feels like it feels like he's gonna have stab Shiv in the back and hightail it out of there or something, or join Sandy and Stewie. I don't know. We overlooked one of the most important uh, characters and one of the most critical moments of this new, uh, the new episode, the new season. I know exactly um, where you're going. <laughs> which is, we found out really big news, like Con, Connor and his... He's holding down friend. the Balkans. <laughs> <laughs> He's holding down the Balkans. Also, they're going to do the, they're going to play the, uh, the um, hate, hate watch, watch angle, angle yeah. on the, uh, on the play. <laughs> I love that. I love that he's forgotten. And then he's like, oh, yes, Connor, Connor. Uh, because because his, his girlfriend is like, oh, oh, Logan. Like, she's like, Logan, please uh, <laughs> Say do, something like, about assign him. something for for Connor. <laughs> so bad day for the con heads. But uh, I guess we have the they have the yeah, what's his uh, what's the, what's the deal with his. Oh, he was being asked to, to drop the presidential run. At the back, end of, at the, at but the, he hadn't dropped yet. So he hadn't dropped it. But the, the deal was if he wanted the money, if he wanted the money he was asking for, then, uh, but maybe holding down the Balkans drop. will be but, enough. Well, maybe holding down the Balkans and maybe if they, if maybe if they play the hate watch angle, that'll <laughs> tide them over. What, what is holding down the Balkans? Like what is, I, I what no is he doing? What, what is, means. what do they expect him to do there? Is he just, <laughs> was, did they just not want to bring him back? Like, is that what was going on? I think, uh, yeah, I think there wasn't was... enough room on, on, jerry shiv and roman's plane because it seemed like there was plenty of room like they don't have territory in the bulk like what is he what's he supposed to do hold it down you know hold it hold hold it down what what hold uh, they don't like is he just supposed to chill on the i mean there's more connor, connor in the next episode that's yeah. all i'll say well okay sounds good i'll look for, i look <laughs> i look forward to it uh great show Great show. Thanks for everybody, uh, to everybody for sticking with us on this long discussion. If you've come all the way, I think we should do, I think we should talk about it again, probably like after, after it wraps up, which, which I think so too. Yeah. While yet. Uh, but, um, yeah, this is best show on my favorite show on TV right now. I think, uh, I always, so here's my thing. And this, uh, this is what we'll close with is everyone always wants to say best show on TV, best show on TV. Which is such a weird thing because that used to mean – because every all the shows used to air at the same time. Right. They used to be like fall to, to spring or whatever. Um, and it was like, oh, so you can actually be the best show on TV because we're comparing them apples to apples. But like is Better Call Saul technically on TV? Right. Is Atlanta yes. technically on TV? Yeah, is Barry? Yeah. And these shows are all – those are I, all in the I running. I think too, Succession yeah. is probably better than those, but it's they're all in competition and like they're all scratching very different itches. Like I yeah. think there's a very good argument to be made that Atlanta is better. Oh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, Donald yeah. Glover is like the only thing that's going to touch Atlanta season 3 and 4 is The Sopranos. Yes. And, and I believe him. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and there's no reason not to believe him and but yeah. we don't no, think about those shows cuz they're not like on tv and like who yeah. knows when the next season of better call saul is coming but i do i do agree that that term has essentially become become meaningless i will say in, in the absence of like strictly defined like seasons of tell like you know yeah. periods where new seasons come out generally what i mean is like it's the best show on tv in this vague like three to four month period wherein <laughs> yeah. like there's no other shows that i'm watching that are better <laughs> I mean, it's definitely uh, <laughs> the best show of the year so far. Um, uh, yeah, having seen yeah. two episodes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I definitely seem to have a type. It's between this or White Lotus. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> Rich White Lotus was great. Looking this like has idiots. the benefit of being like a a show. I mean, I know White Lotus isn't going to be an anthology, not a mini series, but like... Jennifer Coolidge coming back for season two. I just saw yesterday. Nice. So, so at least one be, character is uh, the, the White Lotus cinematic uh, universe will continue. <laughs> the terrible white people doing a colonialism. Uh, I'm assuming. I don't know. Maybe 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 the next season will be about something else. But yeah, I don't I don't think so. Wait, is it going to be the same? <laughs> Do we know anything about it? Is it going to be like the, all I know the is same? that Jennifer Coolidge is back? Yeah, because it would be interesting. I don't know. I I feel like you can't just do like. 
the resort again, but with a different group of people. What if like, she bought the resort though? That would be uh, that would be a that would be a twist. I mean, you uh, could do it. You could do. You could just do the resort every year with a new group of people if you did it right. But it seems like that would be a tough pitch. Anyway, anyway, I have come no back idea what they have. I, yeah. In, when succession ends for our next discussion, and then when succession ends, we'll talk about Twin Peaks. Right? Yes. After <laughs> it'll go succession, then no, finally no, no. We'll for get the around. finale of succession, we're gonna talk. Oh about yeah, Twin yeah. Peaks. We'll, yeah. We'll talk about Twin Peaks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think we should just. We should just use so capitalism has money and power, and we will have. We'll just use the ending <laughs> the dangle of Twin Peaks of, of Twin to Peaks. dangle as a as a you know reward. People can keep listening to the show. Eventually, we'll get to Twin Peaks, and then what we'll do is we'll launch a Patreon, and we'll be like the Stream Theory Patreon exclusive episode. We'll talk about Twin Peaks. This but sounds like a, sign a personal attack over how I've been trying to get people to join my Patreon, so I'll do a Paw Patrol episode of Copaganda. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, that's that's completely uh, that's completely legitimate. <laughs> no, we will uh, we'll 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 get to Twin Peaks eventually. If I mean, the world doesn't it, end before then. it aired in 2018, so I'm not sure there's yeah, like a ticking there's... clock. No. And, and and time seems to not be a real thing in Twin Peaks anyway, so. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, I mean, we could we should just wait 21 years. Uh... <laughs> 25, I think, yeah, right? 25, whatever it was, yeah. Like when, whenever the gum comes back in style again. <laughs> All right, well, uh, go, go watch uh, Jackson's videos on his channel. The Succession uh, one will be coming out next week. Jackson has a succession video coming up, which will probably be not long after this podcast comes out. And I just dropped one on my channel about the how the camera is a char- the character that you never see. Wait, that video is not about Connor. I yeah, thought that sorry. was I thought that was a video just for the con heads, just judging the by the uh, the thumbnail. Yeah. Uh, so go watch those. We're both on Twitter. I'm at Thomas Flight. I'm at Skip is... Intro YT. Skip the YT intro. stands for YouTube. YT I guess. and uh, here we are. Subscribe to <laughs> Stream Theory. Listen wherever you know you're already listening to it. Whatever. You know, we don't have to listen. keep listening. Any yeah? Any other parting words? Uh, no comment. <laughs> no, you don't have to say that. You just, just no comment. <laughs> you Great just me, don't bitch. comment. <laughs> uh, headline: The internet is.